Welcome everyone to the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment webinar series. My name is Matt Balhoff. I'm the director of the center and a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at UT Austin. To learn more about the center, please visit our website, follow us on LinkedIn, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. The center consists of uh, approximately 25 uh, principal investigators look, working on all areas of subsurface energy and the environment. As you see here, along with uh, over 100 graduate students and researchers. In the center, we work on a number of different subsurface applications. We utilize a number of technical disciplines and also engineering tools. We collaborate with industry in many different ways. One of them is with our industrial affiliate programs, a few of which I have listed here. Our monthly webinars are informative industry-driven webinars by researchers and collaborators within the center. They're hosted the second Tuesday of each month at noon via Teams, uh, but all webinars are uploaded to the YouTube channel. So while we encourage you to attend live and, and ask questions, if you're unable to do that, uh, you can watch our YouTube channel or share the, uh, the YouTube link with your colleagues. Our upcoming webinars are next month will Opali and um, I'm sure he'll be talking about surfactants and in March uh, Leo Ruiz. Uh, we ask that uh, you post your questions in the Q&A section. You can do that at any time during the, the talk and um, at the end uh, Dr. Ho will, will answer some of those questions. Um, so uh, we have a very special speaker today. That's uh, Dr. Chun He, which will be talking about green use of nanoparticles and nanobubbles in the oil industry. And a little bit more about Chun. Uh, he received his uh, bachelor's degree from Seoul National University in Korea and his PhD at the University of Minnesota, both in chemical engineering. Uh, prior to coming to UT Austin, he worked as an engineering advisor at ExxonMobil. Uh, he is one of the leading experts on surfactant and polymer based improved oil recovery processes and uh, developed the Chun He equation, which predicts ultra low interfacial tension from micro emulsion solubilization. Here at UT Austin, he's carried out research on use of nanoparticles for upstream oil applications, co authoring over 60 publications in the subject uh, of his book, which is Practical Nanotechnology for Petroleum Engineers. He is a recipient of the Society of Petroleum Engineers IOR Pioneer Award and the very prestigious U.S. National Academy of Engineering. So with that, I'll pass it on to, to John. OK, thanks, Matt, for giving me this opportunity to make a presentation, a webinar presentation. Uh, as we all are very much aware right now, there is a tremendous societal desire to make a quick transition to renewable energy, but the cold truth is that it is very difficult to win from the petroleum energy because petroleum is so intimately intertwined with our everyday life. So this means that we as petroleum engineers should make every effort to minimize the petroleum's footprint on the environment while providing the energy the society needs. So one technology area that uh, I personally feel the upstream oil industry can pay more attention to reduce the petroleum's uh, footprint is the use of nano dispersions, okay, as shown in the next uh, By nano dispersion, what I mean is that the nanoparticles or nano emulsions or nano bubbles whose size is uh, smaller than 100 nanometers, then why these nano dispersions is important for upstream oil industry? Uh, this is because the nano dispersion can flow freely in porous media, as shown on the right hand side. Uh, for example, uh, five nanometer silica nanoparticles at the concentration of the almost 28 percent, it can go just uh, freely through the very tight 10 millidarsi limestone, uh, recovering uh, almost uh, 96 percent of the injected particles. Uh, so, which is a re really remarkable effect for reservoir engineers. 
And then the nanodispersions can have very large surface area per mass because as the size becomes smaller, as schematically shown there, surface area increase drastically. So the surface can serve as effective substrates for reactive, catalytic, sensing, and other functions deep in the reservoir. For example, you can attach chemicals to the nanoparticles or you can make a nanoparticle can selectively absorb or just uh, absorb uh, certain chemicals deep in the reservoir and then come back and uh, retrieve, the, retrieve the data. So that's why it's a very interesting area. And I'll talk about the nanotechnologies, the utilization of individual or cells for some of the functional nanoparticles. So I'll talk about the, basically the nanotechnology in, in general very briefly. And microemulsion, actually this is actually truly the nanoemulsion. I'm not going to uh, go into detail about this, uh, uh, this confusion. has been extensively used for chemical UR and other upstream applications. And uh, UT Austin, as you know, is uh, really the world's leading uh, authority in this area. So I'm not going to talk about this area at this uh, brief seminar. Uh, and then nanobubble is an exciting new technology for CCUS. And at the latter part of this seminar, I'll talk about it uh, uh, briefly. Okay. While the nanoparticles and nanobubbles have been extensively uh, studied and utilized in other industries, for example, in uh, medical industry. The use of nanoparticles and nanobubbles has not been that extensive, only fairly sparsely utilized. And the reason it is shown here, uh, this shows the uh, just a comparison between medical application and our uh, reservoir application. First, the Time scale is different for medical application. Uh, things happen in minutes and hours, but for our application, it takes a days or even years. And then in terms of length of scale, human body application requires only transport of centimeter or meter at the maximum of a meter, but the reservoir application requires its transport in uh, many, many meters and even kilometers. And then temperature, human body is constant temperature, but reservoir temperature can vary drastically from freezing temperature to up to 220 degree Fahrenheit, as you know. And then salinity of the fluid, human body is constant salinity, but uh, in reservoir application, it could range from fresh water to up to 20 to weight percent. So we have, when we are thinking about uh, using nano dispersions for oil field application. First, long-term dispersion stability in reservoir fluid should be uh, met, and then the, it should be able to transport long distance in the reservoir, and then it should be able to attach preferentially at target sites. So unlike medical application, as shown at the bottom, functionalized coating of nanoparticle surface is really key, and this uh, fact is not appreciated by uh, many people who try to utilize nanotechnology for oil field applications, okay? So with the green use of nanoparticles and nanobubbles in the industry, I'll just, uh, because of the short time frame we have, I'll just uh, 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 describe very briefly some of the research we carried out at the department. Uh, I'll talk about the nanoparticle usage, uh, the two topics I will uh, briefly discuss, that is, uh, Ultra dry CO2 in water forms as waterless fracturing liquid or uh, fluid. And there, silicon nanoparticles can be stabilized uh, forms of emergency even for harsh reservoir conditions. That's the reason it is uh, studied. And then, super paramagnetic nanoparticles to remove micron size oil droplets or other contaminants from produced water, which can be selectively attached to the magnetite nanoparticle surface and then collected and removed. Really the exciting feature about the use of nanoparticles especially is that they can be recovered, regenerated, and reused. 
So that's the, I'm really trying to emphasize here. As for the nano bubbles, okay, uh, stabilizer free, that is surfactant free, but still stable nano bubbles, which is effectively homogeneous and transparent, can deliver a large mass of these specific gases to a target subsurface formation with a proper mobility control. So, which means that improved oil recovery from or CO2 sequestration in metro hydrocarbon reservoirs and equal joints can be carried out with a proper mobility control. So that's the exciting aspect of this uh, uh, nanobubble, uh, potential use of nanobubbles for the upstream oil application. Uh, I'll talk about the nanoparticles, okay. But what is the with nanotechnology or nanoparticles uh, for petroleum engineers? Why we should we be interested in this? Maybe you've seen in the uh, petroleum lit literature, but widely uh, published uh, application is uh, so-called nanofluid. That is, uh, nanoparticles are added to water for water flooding for the small uh, improved oil recovery. There the key mechanism is the nanoparticle goes into the reservoir rock and absorbed on the rock pore surface so that al uh, alter the wettability. Okay, so that's the main mechanism. And in our department, we haven't really looked at this aspect that much because uh, we feel that uh, IOR mechanism is not fully understood. And then to change the wettability alteration with the nanoparticles, uh, it takes a large volume of the nanoparticles. So we are just uh, watching it very carefully, but we haven't done any work uh, in this area. Uh, here, as shown on the right-hand side, the work carried out at the UT Austin is in uh, blue font. We did uh, quite a bit of work on nanoparticle stabilizer forms and emulsions, for example, for, as I said, improved mobility control of gas UR processes, and as a fracturing fluid and uh, drilling fluid additives, and then for viscosity reduction for improved heavy oil recovery. Uh, that I think there's uh, some current research effort going on in this area. And we did fairly extensive research on using nanoparticles as a sensors deep in the reservoir, that is using super parametric nanoparticles for remote sensing. And other uh, industry researchers worked on this, for example, in Saudi Arabia, they use the so-called ABOT or nanobot uh, for data acquisition from injected uh, and retrieved nanoparticles so that they can uh, interrogate uh, uh, nanoparticles to obtain uh, reservoir data. And nanorheology modifiers have been uh, worked on, but it's well integrity for shale zone drilling. And we did quite extensive work here in the our department, did uh, Professor Sharma. And then nanoparticle added UR polymer is being researched right now in the department. Nanoparticle based smart coating. Uh, this is to inhibit or remove the deposits from uh, pipes in the wall. Uh, this is quite uh, potentially a uh, very innovative idea, and we've, did, we've done uh, uh, quite a bit of work in this area. And then, nanoparticle coating can be utilized for the corrosion and abrasion resistant purposes. And, and additionally, there are nanoparticle added metals and ceramics for improve the strength and reduce the weight of hardware materials. And then nanoparticle polymer composites for improve the elasticity and nanomembranes to convert hard brine to soft brine, such as carried out at the shell. And nanoparticle catalyst in situ heavy oil upgrading purposes. Okay, so. Uh, moving on to the green use of nanoparticles, I'll first talk about the ultra dry CO2 in water forms as uh, waterless uh, fracturing uh, fluid. The reason I put the quote at the waterless is not entirely waterless, but uh, extremely of the amount of water is uh, uh, reduced. Okay. Before I talk about it, I need to talk briefly about the basics of this. this uh, nanoparticle stabilizer forms and emergence. Okay. Nanoparticle, uh, if wettability is, uh, it, it, uh, 
require a certain rotability, it acts just like a surfactant. So if the CO2 or oil and water partially with nanoparticle surface, then the, it acts like a surfactant forming so-called pickering emulsion or pickering form. So for the hydrophobic, or you know, hydrophilic nanoparticles whose contact angle is smaller than 90 degrees, then it forms, as shown on the right hand, bottom right-hand side, CO2 in water forms. But if the nanoparticles' rotability is hydrophobic, that is, contact angle is larger than 90 degrees, then it forms water in CO2 form. So by changing rotability of these nanoparticles, we can change the structure of the form. So that is actually the, quite the fascinating feature. And the third cochlea is just a repeat of the earlier uh, mentioned that nanoparticles being solid provide better tolerance to high temperature and high salinity than surfactant and can carry other uh, functionalities. So to use uh, nanoparticle stabilized forms uh, to reduce the water usage in hydraulic fracturing, it, it shows it schematically shows the scheme. That is, when the fractures are formed the, at the horizontal well, okay, uh, nanoparticle stabilized form is injected as a fracturing fluid okay, with the CO2 CO2 as the interface, and because. Uh, it is formed, it is a fairly high apparent viscosity, and it can also carry uh, propan sand and, re of course, reduce the water usage. So, these new materials and techniques give two novel forms, which are initially high viscosity to carry propan, and then low viscosity to help oil production. That because uh, we can make nanoparticle stability can go down. So the forms reduce water usage by up to uh, 90%. That's our uh, laboratory uh, study uh, showed. Okay. So this again shows a similar picture of the how the uh, ultra dry nanoparticle slide forms serve as a fracturing fluid. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this a dry form can carry open particles and then uh, usually, to achieve the very dry form state, that is uh, over 90%, 90 volume percent uh, CO2 gas in the form, okay, we, we need some, actually, some surfactant and sometimes some small amount of the polymer. And these uh, combination squeezes into the between, lamella between large foam bubbles, so they jam just uh, this uh, prevent the uh, coalescence of the foam bubbles. At the bottom shows this uh, red opaque but highly dense foam texture, and uh, this kind of this texture uh, doesn't become uh, coarsen coarsening uh, up to 24 hours or more, as shown in this uh, uh, picture. And the top it shows the Microsoft picture of this uh, uh, one percent nanoparticle stabilized form with some addition of the uh, polymer and the betaine uh, surfactant, and uh, up to twenty four hours uh, form texture uh, doesn't vary that much, so you can maintain good uh, viscosity, the apparent viscosity in the fracturing fluid uh, during the fracturing process. At the bottom shows the apparent viscosity. As you can see, even if the internal CO2 phase volume fraction is 90%, which is a lot of CO2, uh, apparent viscosity, form viscosity can go up to 200 centipores, which we believe is a quite remarkable uh, behavior. You see if such a, a nanoparticle stabilized form can be applied to actually in the fracturing purposes, we developed some uh, uh, simulation software and did uh, uh, screening simulation studies as shown in this picture as a sample, okay? Uh, top picture shows the water saturation inside uh, reservoir near the fracture zone. If you use this water for fracturing fluid, of course, water goes into the 
uh, near refractor near joint quite a lot. But if you use a foam, uh, this uh, invasion into the near fracture reservoir joint is small. And the uh, bottom picture shows the nanoparticle concentration inside uh, that uh, near fracture reservoir joint. So this, with this kind of software, we could do some uh, reservoir application screening studies. So that's kind of the all in presentation of this uh, use of nanoparticles for the uh, foam generation, especially ultra dry silt foam generation. And I'll move on to the use of the super paramagnetic nanoparticles to remove the micron size oil droplets from produced water. Okay. The purpose is to selectively remove contaminant from produced water using uh, magnetic nanoparticles, which can be collected and removed. Okay. Before I do that again, I need to describe briefly the useful properties of the super paramagnetic nanoparticles. This is actually a fascinating area. So super paramagnetic nanoparticles have four very intriguing properties. First, by applying magnetic field gradient, nanoparticles can be forced to move in desired direction, okay? And then on the applied high frequency magnetic oscillation, nanoparticles can generate intense highly localized heat that's known as uh, hypothermia and it's used in medical discipline to cure the cancer, okay? And then on the applied magnetic field, nanoparticle ensemble generates magnetic induction field along remote sensing. Again, this is utilized in the medical field, and we did earlier some research here for whether we can apply this technique for remote sensing in deep reservoir. And again, surface coating can be designed for nanoparticle to attach to desired location. For example, uh, stable form emerging generation or can we decide other uh, desired functions. In, as I said, other industries employed uh, these super paramagnetic nanoparticles a lot. So we looked into the utilization of this uh, technology developed by other industry for improved oil production. For example, enhanced magnetic imaging, uh, we could use it for reservoir sensing. For example, injecting nanoparticle dispersions to generate magnetic induction fields in the reservoir for, for the detection, and also to retrieve at the producers as multiple magnetic traces for reservoir fluid flow analysis. And then magnetic separation, can be utilized for water management, as I will describe briefly uh, later, the removal of the dispersed old water droplets or multivalent ions uh, from produced fluid. And then hypothermia, this uh, localized heating, can be utilized for precision conformance control, that is intense localized heating to create gel at high permeability layers using uh, temperature responsive polymer, which can be broken if needed. We did some work in this area, so anybody is interested, they can contact us. And then the idea of the drug delivery can be utilized to deliver targeted delivery of uh, chemicals, such as the uh, in-situ upgrading catalyst uh, uh, for the ore uh, traces uh, to be being mobilized. Okay, uh, I want to just give you some flavor of how the dysfunctionalized uh, magnetic nanoparticles is uh, synthesized. Okay. First step is this wet chemistry. That is uh, putting the ferric chloride and ferrite, you know, ferrous chloride together in alkaline environment. We create the precipitation of the uh, magnetite crystals and then at the certain side of the crystal aggregate, it, we suddenly quench it so that we can produce uh, magnetic, uh, magnetic uh, super paramagnetic, uh, this FP3O4 nanoparticles, okay? And then to that, you, by hydrolysis, we attach amine uh, group 
and I'm not going to into detail. And you can do some, for example, at the bottom shown that you can do polyacrylic acid uh, attachment to this amine group to have the uh, negative charge on the surface, very large amount of negative charge on the surface of the uh, nanoparticles, magnetic nanoparticles, okay? I'll go into that in some detail. Uh, this I need to talk uh, briefly. That is addition of this silica shell to the fe 304 magnetic nanoparticles to protect uh, magnetic core, iron oxide core from degradation. So, and then additionally, uh, silica has very good flexibility to attach functional chemical groups. So silica shell is a very good addition to the magnetic nanoparticles. Uh, you have to remember that uh, silica shell does not interfere with the uh, magnetic field transmission. Okay, And so we, the main reason we put the silica shell is uh, for the durability of iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles during their repeated regeneration. And one important step in the uh, nanoparticle synthesis is the characterization. That is uh, to confirm if we actually uh, generated uh, desired nanoparticles. So we have to do a series of these uh, uh, characterization uh, steps. Uh, one step is uh, observing the nanoparticle aggregate from, for example, transmission electron microscope. I'm sorry, the uh, length of scale is not shown, but on the left photo, top aggregate is about 50 nanometer size. And then on the right-hand side is uh, uh, this uh, magnetic nanoparticle uh, with uh, silica shell on the surface. The right-hand bottom figure is a so-called vibrating sample magnetometer. This is to ensure that our super paramagnetic nanoparticle has the super paramagnetism. That is, uh, when the magnetic field is applied, it becomes a small magnet, but when the magnetic field is uh, disappear, it just becomes an ordinary uh, nanoparticle. Okay. And I'll show the with just uh, using schematic diagram the process for all droplet separation and recycling of nanoparticles. Here on the left-hand side, this uh, micron size oil droplets in produced water is mixed with the uh, magnetic nanoparticle dispersion. And we mix, for example, one-to-one -one volume fraction and then just uh, stir vigorously. And then we put the magnet on the side, that's the application of the magnetic field gradient. Then not only the magnetic nanoparticles, but also all droplets attach the magnetic nanoparticles are collected to the side. So we can remove the clean water and collect this uh, oil droplets with the nanoparticles and we just wash it. And again, using magnetic field, we can collect only the magnetic nanoparticles and then uh, dispose of this, this uh, oil droplets, or you can utilize it in some other way. And then uh, with the alkali treatment, we can regenerate magnetic nanoparticles and reuse it. Okay. So we, we carried out uh, fairly extensive uh, work for the removal efficiency of different oil types in different brine. This graph shows this uh, uh, oil content removal percentage. The oil content, initial oil content was uh, 0.25 weight percent. And uh, three different oils were studied uh, showing the um, total acid number of the 0.15 and up to the 4.5, which is highly acidic uh, oil. Okay, And the left uh, bars are for API brine and right is a synthetic seawater. And amount of the magnetic particle is shown in this uh, amount of uh, ion in the particles, uh, 875 milligram per liter. Uh, sorry about this, uh, this difficult conversion, but it's a very low concentration. Okay, and you can see that oil content removal efficiency is almost a perfect 100% there. Okay, so we're actually quite pleased with the result. Uh, 
we also studied the uh, how the removal efficiency changes with the uh, regenerated uh, nanoparticles. Okay, as shown here, uh, we did that study for two different acid number oil. One is the ash number of 2.9, another is ash number of 4.5. Uh, notice that on the vertical scale on the left-hand side, it starts from 99% uh, removal efficiency to 100%. So that small green bar does not mean it's bad. It's still 99.3% removal of the oil droplets, okay? Uh, for the virgin blue bias for the aversion use of the nanoparticles. And then uh, next one is uh, first and regenerated nanoparticles and second one is uh, second regenerated nanoparticles. And we could reuse nanoparticles up to four times. Uh, our objective was uh, we wanted to use nanoparticles uh, more than 10 times, but we haven't uh, accomplished that uh, objective yet. So that's one task uh, we or somebody else uh, need to carry out uh, if they are interested in this topic. Okay, next schematic diagram is actually uh, almost the uh, same as before, but I just want to show that there's a, on the center, there's a faint a gray background uh, picture of this, uh, how to rem attach uh, calcium cations to the magnetic nanoparticles. So that's uh, removing uh, multivalent cations to make the hard brine to soft brine. And then left to bottom, left to side bottom, we show the how to remove the remnant UR polymer, which is produced from, for example, from polymer floating application. So still available in the produced water, how to remove this uh, remnant polymer, your polymer using nanoparticles. Other than that, it's a uh, process is exactly the same. That is, uh, depending on the application, we can apply different surface coating for nanoparticles to do the job. Okay, that's the key point here. Okay, that's the uh, very quick overview of the nanoparticle, green use of uh, nanoparticles in the upstream oil industry. Uh, just to give you some idea of uh, what has been done and what's going on. Okay, now I'll move on to the green use of nanobubbles. This is a totally new area. Uh, this technology was originally developed by Japanese scientists to increase the productivity of the fish farms, okay? Uh, they noticed that uh, if you <clears throat> increase the, uh, the so amount of the dissolved oxygen in the water, it can enhance the growth of the fish. But they realized that you cannot put the uh, oxygen bubbles in, into the water, simply into the water, because as you know, this uh, trapping of uh, gas bubbles in the living body is uh, really fatal, so you cannot do that. But they realized that if you reduce the size of the gas bubbles to nano size, it can flow freely in the uh, animal's uh, blood veins or the plant uh, capillaries. So that's how this was developed in Japan. And it's applied also by waste treatment to enhance the methane production from aerobic and anaerobic digestion, okay? And also, it has been used for drug delivery, so inclusion of the hydrophobic drugs in nanobubbles, okay? Uh, most of the drugs are actually the, has a surface wettability, hydrophobic wettability, so you cannot really disperse easily in just a water or bloodstream. So you can include in, in very tiny nanobubbles, inside the nanobubbles, so that it can be delivered properly in the uh, human body, everywhere in human body. And it has been used for mineral processing, for enhanced attachment of the desired mineral particles for flotation purposes. Then, <clears throat> why is nanobubble potentially useful for the upstream oil industry? Because 
even without using stabilizer such as surfactant or nanoparticles, it can remain stable for days and sometimes for months, amazingly, depending on the condition. And it can contain a very large mass of gas, for example, more than 20 times of the sum of the solubility of gas. Okay? And more important point is that uh, it is effectively homogeneous and transparent, transparent as shown on the right-hand side. This is a uh, nitrogen nanobubbles in brine. Uh, I think it, uh, this is a 5% NHL brine at 4,000 pound pressure. This is a sapphire cell, to, a sapphire cell photo. Actually, the work carried out in this department uh, recently by Dr. Uh, Yusuke Okuno's group. Okay? And then it can have a high supersaturation of gas in water, which results from very high capillary pressure across the bubble interface. As you know, uh, across the bubble interface, uh, this, uh, according to young Laplace equation, there's a capillary, high capillary pressure inside. Okay, so that can force the the water around it have a high uh, saturation pressure. So that helps to make the water super saturated. Okay. And then the first question, of course, immediately comes to you, your mind is, how is the nanobubble stable without a stabilizer? That's unheard of it. So, you, of course, that's the, any question any uh, reservoir engineer or petroleum engineer will ask. Uh, it turns out that that's possible, despite the fact that due to high capillary pressure inside a bubble, as I mentioned briefly a moment ago, gas diffuses out and bubble shrinks until some of the is established between bubble and saturated water. So if the water is fresh without any uh, gas in it, dissolved, then bubble collapses quickly. But the water contains enough saturated gas in it, then it can stay a long time, okay? Then the second quote that is very important for reservoir application, that is high pressure and core confinement generally observed in subsurface formations significantly reduce the overall ripening, which is what I just described actually, and allow long-term integrity of nanobubbles. Okay? So that's why, as shown on, as shown on the top uh, right-hand corner, this nanobubbles can stay, um, for example, like uh, 140 days uh, with a size uh, around 100, slightly smaller than 100 nanometers, okay? Uh, another important point from a kinetic point of view, state point of view is that the uh, nanobubble surface is generally electrically charged, especially for CO2 with a uh, carbonyl anion. So, to the extent that uh, the nanobubble dispersion has a reasonably long-term dispersion stability. Uh, this is because uh, charge regulation happens on the surface of the shrinking bubbles. I'm not going to into detail about this, a theoretical detail about this. And then the, the weak van der Waals attraction between bubbles also helps the long-term stability of nanobubbles. And then another thing which we need more study is really attachment of nanoparticles to the nanobubbles can significantly enhance the nanobubble stability. This is a something uh, we need to study further. So nanobubble stability without use of uh, stabilizer, we believe is it's real. So that's why we're very much excited about this topic and uh, looking into the, its application uh, potential. So, Moving on to the nanobubbles for CCUS and uh, hydrogen storage. For CO2-based EOR processes, it can be used as the mobility control bank in, in lieu of the water in WAC. That is a WAC water alternating gas process uses a small bank of water, gas, water, gas. Instead of water, 
we can utilize this nano bubble uh, dispersed water, and then or in lieu of this surfactant sterilized CO2 form. Okay, then nano bubbles in water enhanced water enhanced transform CO2 to oil phase, reducing the the notorious the water blocking effect, which has been studied extensively in this department by, for example, uh, with the publication of classical paper by Dr. Lake. Okay, and for secure uh, delivery of CO2 to the target sequestration volume, uh, again utilizing the novel mobility control scheme. Okay, we can in the reservoir. We cannot just simply inject the CO2 because it's a very low viscosity. So uh, we need to have some form of the mobility control. And this wax using uh, CO2 nanobubbles can do the job. Okay. And additionally, the supersaturation in water also enhances the kinetics of CO2 mineralization. And this has a potential to significantly increase the solubility trapping and mineral trapping. I'm not going to detail, but uh, for the CO2 trapping in the uh, <clears throat> subsurface formations, there are four known important trapping mechanisms. And solubility trapping and mineral trapping is most important mechanism. And uh, nano bubble dispersion can help increase and help accelerate. Uh, these are uh, trapping mechanisms uh, activation. And then for secure delivery of uh, hydrogen to target storage volume utilizing the above novel mobility control scheme. So even though there's active research going on, I'm not going to uh, talk about the details because uh, Dr. Okuno will uh, publish it uh, soon. Okay. So that's the brief description of use of nanodispersions, green use of nanodispersions for the upstream oil industry. All the work has been carried out by other uh, uh, researchers and graduate students and postdocs. And this is this acknowledgement and also the contact persons for these, if you're interested in these topics, for the nanoparticles, silicon nanoparticles for form, Professor David DeCarlo, Marja Prodanovic, uh, Kisha Moanti, and Keith Johnson of Chemical Engineering worked uh, extensively in this area. And for silicon nanoparticles for emulsion, uh, Hugh Daigles, and then magnetic, paramagnetic nanoparticles, uh, Hugh Daigle and Marja Prodanovic worked on this extensively. And then, even though I, I did not talk about the microemulsion applications, which is, uh, you know, very well, our department is very good at this. And we still have the chemical EOR consortium, which was uh, studied by uh, Professor Larry Lake, no, Professor Gary Pope, and, and uh, currently Professors Matt Baloff and Kisha Monti is uh, uh, main uh, PI for this. And then nano bubbles, uh, CCUS consortium is run by right now Professor Ryosuke. Okuno, this is a very uh, exciting topic personally for me. So for that reason, I'll put uh, their consortium uh, <clears throat> uh, picture here. It's called Energy Simulation Industrial Affiliated uh, Project on Carbon Utilization Storage. The reason it's called Energy Simulation is that uh, there's a uh, energy simulation, which is formerly the Canada's uh, CMD Foundation is a, is a big donor for this uh, particular project. They have a big push for uh, CCUS. Uh, so that's the reason uh, this is called. And if anybody's interested in this topic, uh, please contact Dr. Yokuno, Ryusuke Okuno. Okay. So that with that, I end my prepared presentation. And I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you have. How is the stability CO2 nominal at high pressure and after depressurizing? Do we have reversible or irreversible conversion of nanobubbles to supercritical form? Uh, good question. 
I think it's uh, reversible, okay? But uh, yeah, we want to maintain high pressure to maintain its integrity or stability and the reservoir condition. So we don't want to lower the pressure for the reservoir application, which is a reasonable uh, assumption for deep reservoir application. Uh, I don't know if I answered the question properly here. Okay. And next question is, can you change the wettability of nanobubbles like you can with nanoparticles? Uh, our focus at the moment is that we want to use nanobubbles without use of surfactant or uh, stabilizing nanoparticles because of the mainly environmental reasons, okay? So the thing which is exciting about the nanobubble is it can stay stable for quite a long time without use of surfactant. So, so we want to do that, but uh, there's a literature in, uh, saying that uh, with a small amount of surfactant usage, actually the nanobubble stability can be increased. So that's a uh, next step. Uh, uh, we or some other people look into it. So that's uh, actually quite uh, interesting uh, aspect. Okay, next question is from Steve Bryant. Hello, Steve. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm glad you participated in this. Uh, Steve Bryan was the main driver for this uh, nanotechnology application development in this uh, department, even though he's now with the University of Calgary. What volume fraction of nanobubbles can be achieved? At, uh, at the moment, uh, probably about 20%. Yeah, one of the big uh, tasks is how to increase amount of this uh, uh, nanobubble density in the water. So that's important question we need to satisfy. Next question is why use non CO2 nano dispersion for nano secretion instead of the plain gas? Uh, I thought I explained it, tried to explain it, but I didn't su succeed. That is, uh, if you inject you want to confine your injected CO2 in a certain storage volume, such as the, at the bottom of the anticline, okay? So if you inject CO2 in the subsurface formation, because of its low viscosity, it just uh, zips through uh, formation, high permeability formation, and if there's any natural factors, they'll just go through the formation very fast. It's a well-known fact for reservoir engineers. So that's not good, okay? So it can show any place on the surface uh, later on. So we want to store the injected CO2 in a control volume, controlled volume. So we need to do that. To do that, we need to have a proper mobility control. So that's why we're advocating use of nanobubbles. Next question is, uh, will nanobubbles stay stable on the high pressure and temperature? Uh, we haven't tested in very high temperature, but high pressure, yes. Actually, high pressure is better. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. These are all very exciting ideas and applications. Thank you. Uh, I share your uh, enthusiasm. Are they economical to apply in actual field operations or are they still in research development phase? Uh, it, in Japan, uh, they're trying to actually inject nanobubble, okay? They are actually pushing this very hard, okay? And uh, it's at the moment, mostly it's in research and development stage, but uh, its application in the field will come very fast. That's what I believe and uh, Dr. Okuno believes. Uh, thanks for all for attending, for participating in this uh, webinar. And uh, even though uh, I fully admit that it's a very incomplete uh, discussion of the nanoparticles and nanobubbles, but still uh, I want to just convey my strong desire to utilize 
this technology for the purpose of uh, just uh, reducing petroleum's uh, footprint on the environment. That's uh, that's my strong desire. With that, I'll finish my yeah talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, th thanks a lot. Um, I want to thank our speaker, Dr. Chun Ha, for an excellent presentation. And I'd like to thank uh, all of our attendees for attending live today. We will be posting this webinar on YouTube within the next couple of days and encourage you to uh, share that with your colleagues. Um, and we will see you in one month, so the second Tuesday of the month. And uh, Opali will be talking to us almost surely about uh, surfactants. So I'll see you then.